Castles constructed in the medieval period were surrounded by a deep, broad ditch of water called a moat. This was done specifically to keep out enemies or at least delay an impending invasion. Needless to say, the bigger the moat, the larger is the protection offered. The modern day version of the castle and moat are the companies and the competitive advantages that they carry. In fact, the term economic moat was popularized by none other than Warren Buffett himself and is used to represent a structural characteristic that allows a firm to generate a high return on capital for an extended period of time and make life difficult for its competitors. Take Coca-Cola for instance. It's the world's most recognized brand that is sold in every country on this planet except Cuba and North Korea. The Coca-Cola company gives predictable cash flows, delivers a return on equity of over 50%, but most significantly, even if a competitor comes up with a matching product and is given a $10 billion annual marketing budget, it is very unlikely that they would be able to displace Coca-Cola's dominance in the carbonated soft drinks market. Such is the power of a strong economic moat and in this video we shall examine seven different economic moats with some supporting examples. The idea here is for you to start looking at stocks not just from a price perspective but to also understand and appreciate the competitive advantage that each of them also holds. Let's begin. An intangible asset is a non-physical asset or attribute that gives a clear advantage to the company. What makes intangibles a very powerful moat is that they are impossible to replicate and often take many years to build. For instance, the Tata brand is often linked to trust. Now observe here that it was not Mr. Tata or their marketing team that manufactured this association. It's the many years of operating nation building businesses, their employee friendly policies and tirelessly serving their customers that has helped them receive such credibility. In fact, one indicator of a company's brand power is if people start referencing it in their daily lives. Something like just Google it or zara fevikol leke aana or WhatsApp me number bhej dena etc. Net net brand led businesses find it a lot easier to retain customers, charge premium pricing, attract the best talents and deliver high return on capital to their shareholders. Yet another set of intangible assets are patents, trade secrets and intellectual property. A patent is generally granted for a period of 20 years and is a very powerful moat as it keeps the competition at bay. Think of businesses like Gillette with their safety razor, Intel with their computer chips, pharmaceutical companies, etc. Qualcomm is an excellent example of a business that has patented a lot of the communication technologies that get used in today's mobile phones. So anywhere around the planet, when any mobile phone gets sold, Qualcomm gets a cut from the sale price, which cumulatively contributes over $6 billion of revenue to the company. With regards to trade secrets, one can't think of a better example than the Coca-Cola company which has kept its signature drink formula a secret for over a hundred years. And then there are intellectual properties that extend to copyright and licensing that are protected by law such that no other business can use them without the holder's permission. An example of intellectual property is Mickey Mouse and other valuable fictional characters that are owned by the Walt Disney Company. The IPs come with legal protection, probably without the safeguards of which Disney may not have been one of the most dominant entertainment companies in the world. So as an investor, look out for companies which have valuable patents, trademarks, IPs and trade secrets as these are impossible to clone and give companies a strong defensible moat. If the cost of switching from one service to the other is high, then that company has a moat. Now the word cost need not always refer to money. A switching cost can also be in terms of the time it takes or the effort one needs to put in. For example, opening a new savings account is very easy nowadays and one doesn't even have to go and visit a bank branch to do that. But when you switch from one bank to the other, it comes with a number of important incidental activities that one needs to do. Things like informing your home loan company, changing auto debit details for your SIP, 
your Amazon Prime subscription, making changes in the income tax portal, reporting it in your ITR, etc. So come to think of it, while switching banks is functionally easy, it still is a pain in the neck. And perhaps that's why people tend to stay with the bank for at least six years before switching, making the savings account a big white moat for a bank. The same principle applies to organizations as well. In fact, given our bureaucratic standards, the switching costs there are even higher. For example, say a business retains the services of a payroll processing company or sets up a CRM software for their inbound call center. Initiatives like these require a lot of upfront efforts such as vendor selection, approval from the board, integrating with other systems, training the employees, annual maintenance, etc. In effect, this work effort to get things running becomes a big moat for the seller as any buyer will think twice before moving to another company. Some examples of this includes buying airplanes from Boeing or software from Microsoft or Oracle, elevators from Otis, salary bank accounts with HDFC Bank and using the banking software Finicle which is developed by Infosys. So the higher the switching cost, the bigger is the moat. Being the cheapest provider of goods and services can be a formidable moat as many consumers equate low cost to a superior overall experience. And in that context, it comes as no surprise that companies with cost leadership tend to outperform the competition over longer periods of time and offer higher returns on invested capital to their shareholders. Now, business can become a low cost provider in three scenarios. A, it has a locational advantage or B, it has some process-based advantage, or C, it has a scale-based advantage. A location advantage is not just about being at the right place, but it is also about being the first one there. For instance, say an infrastructure company is the first one to build a dam, a power line, or a road somewhere. This means it won't be feasible, logical, or profitable for any competitors of theirs to build another dam or power line or road next to it because if that happens, then nobody makes money. When it comes to being at the right place, one needs to look at a Shri Cement Limited, which in addition of having easy access to limestone reserves, also has the advantage of being able to cater to 80% of its customers within 200 kilometers of its plant location. A process-based advantage is one that opens up a cheaper and more efficient way of doing something. For instance, Tupperware bypasses expensive advertising to create Tupperware home parties which were not only cost efficient for the company but were also more effective. Similarly, companies like Dell Computers and Geico Insurance bypassed middlemen and offered their goods and services at a lower cost thereby creating a process advantage. Now, one point investors should keep note of here is that a process advantage is time bound and lasts only till the competition catches up. Of course, this can happen over a month, an year or even a decade, but eventually competitors do replicate the process and the advantage evaporates. And the third source of low cost is economies of scale, which in simple words refers to the cost advantage of a business due to its size. Companies like Amazon, Costco, Walmart, Toyota, Maruti Suzuki can charge lower prices than their competitors due to the increased savings that results from their high production volumes. This then turns into a recurring loop and as these companies continue to grow bigger, they get better prices from their suppliers which then helps them to grow even bigger. In fact, Jeff Bezos said it best when he was on the verge of launching his Amazon Prime service and I quote, I want to draw a moat around our best customers. We are not going to take our best customers for granted. It comes as no surprise that as of April 2021, Prime has over 200 million subscribers worldwide and is today one of the most powerful moats that Amazon has built. Toll moats are businesses which are the sole supplier of something that the customer needs. Think of it like a ferry service between two islands. There are no roads, there are no airports, you can't swim in those shark infested waters. So a ferry ride is your only option and by that logic, one shouldn't be surprised if the ticket is a bit overpriced. 
Such toll modes are generally found in essential sectors like oil, agriculture, defense, railways, energy, etc. and more prominently in companies where the government has a majority shareholding. For example, IRCTC has a toll mode of being the only entity that is authorized by the Indian Railways to offer online railway tickets. Similarly, there is Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, there is Coal India which has an 82% market share, Container Corporation of India, etc. But having said this, monopolies need not be there in government controlled industries only. For example, there is Pedilite Industries that has a 70% share of India's adhesive market. There is also ITC with a 77% market share in cigarettes. The Adani Group has been taking charge of many Indian airports. And of course, there is Bharti Airtel and Reliance Geo, which have been fighting the airways battle for many years now. Net-net, toll modes are a little protectionistic in their setup, but are also excellent businesses to own and invest over the long term. The network effect is a phenomenon whereby a product or service becomes increasingly valuable as more people use it. It's a positive feedback loop which comes with an unlimited amount of momentum. Take YouTube for example. So YouTube was launched in 2005 and it began with only a few videos. But as more users started posting videos, more people began searching for these videos and thus started the positive loop which became bigger and bigger over time. It's this network effect of more videos and searches that allowed YouTube to grow exponentially with no real competition in sight. Other examples of the network effect would include Amazon and the millions of suppliers and customers that participate in that marketplace, Microsoft with their Windows and Office products which are an essential part of any office environment, Facebook which is synonymous with one's social identity, WhatsApp as a communication medium, and many other communities like Twitter, Uber, Ola, Oyo, India Mart, etc. that continue to display the network effect and build a big wide moat around their business that is only becoming bigger and wider in time. While this is not commonly discussed, a cultural moat has a lot of value to add in the building of some iconic brands and companies. A cultural moat, as the name suggests, is based on a company's value proposition, brand and tradition that can then provide some distinct competitive advantages to companies that use them wisely. For example, we already discussed Tata in reverence to the image of trust that is portrayed. The Virgin Group is another example of a brand that combines innovation, fun, audacity and youthful self-belief to make differentiated offerings in established markets. Today, the group interests have expanded to music, airlines, banking, gyms, aerospace, books, hotels, trains, sports, etc. while still retaining its bold and youthful appeal. In the last 30 years, technology and the internet have emerged as the big moat builders of our time, which is leaving its mark on the more traditional functions as well. Take marketing for instance. The 20th century was more about advertising. You put in money, buy airtime, win eyeballs, build awareness, and then maybe people buy your product or service. However, this century's modes are not being created by marketing dollars as much as they are being built around content, organic search SEO pages, user-generated content, YouTube videos, answers on Quora, Reddit discussions, Instagram posts, etc. The more organically the users reach your content, the wider and more powerful your moat becomes. Now, one area I particularly want to talk about is the role of data as a moat. The 2020s have already been labeled as the data decade and this should not surprise us. Data analytics is becoming a big part of every company's business model as industries continue to invest and imbibe things like machine learning, artificial intelligence and automation. In our view, there are three ways in which data modes are being created. Firstly, there is the use of data as an operational advantage with progressive companies like Amazon tracking every nook and corner of their operations. 
these terabytes of data so collected are then analyzed and incorporated into the company's operating strategy, which then brings in more users, more margins, and a better customer experience. A second use of data in building a moat is when it drives a core product advantage. And the best example of that is Netflix, whose brilliant recommendation engine understands the user's tastes, likes, and dislikes, making it a formidable moat for their platform. Another example of leveraging data would be Uber's demand and supply matching algorithm, which again lies in the heart of the ride-sharing app. And finally, data can also be turned into a business opportunity. While the more obvious examples are Facebook and Google, which use data to serve highly targeted ads, there are still a number of unique applications for data-powered businesses. For instance, Netflix actually uses its vast data banks to predict what new TV shows and movies it should create that their subscribers would love to watch. So when Netflix produced House of Cards, it was not really a gamble because the data showed that the TV series would be a success. What I love, of course, is a big castle and a big moat with piranhas and crocodiles. Now, I didn't say this. It's what Warren Buffett said in 1994. And although we continually see the evolution of economic moats in different forms and shapes, we all can be assured that maintaining a distinct, durable, and sustainable competitive advantage will become even more important in the future. But having said this, businesses will do well to remember that just having a moat is never going to be enough. It's also important that the economic moat continues to serve the consumer's interest and keeps up with innovation. In other words, moats should not make a company complacent, and especially now when technology is making the traditional moats narrower and shallower. Remember, you want companies with big white moats and preferably moats that are getting bigger and wider over time. And with this, we come to the end of this video. I sincerely hope this video has given you an insight into what key competitive advantages one should look for in a company, whether you are a business owner or an investor. If you learned something new today, then don't forget to share this video with your friends. Do subscribe to our channel, do like this video, and I look forward to catching up with you next time. Until then. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.